Hey students, this is our next installment, next lecture. We're getting started on the historical uh, part of US history. We've gotten through the civics portion, talking about our government and the different branches. You just took that test. Hopefully you feel like you did well on it. So launching now into the next couple of weeks and into our new calendar is our first historical uh, sort of lesson. Our lecture really uh, to get us into uh, where we are going, where you left off in the eighth grade, and that is what's called the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And so this is just going to be a short lecture today, but it's going to be one of, uh, I believe, about six kind of lectures, and I'll try to go as quickly and be as brief as possible, <clears throat> but still get you the info that you need uh, to be successful. Thanks for watching, and uh, thanks for your encouragement of learning U.S. history. And so I'll get right into our slideshow. So this is uh, supposedly after the Civil War in Reconstruction. We'll talk briefly about the Reconstruction and because it has a tremendous impact on us today and in terms of race, race relations and even what's going on in our country today. Uh, but I first want to start with what is the Gilded Age? Why is it called that? Uh, what are going to be the results of the Gilded Age? And then uh, next time, next week, I'll get into Reconstruction. So there's a lot going on. We finished the Civil War in which uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans are going to die over basically the issue of slavery. Is it something that's going to continue uh, in the United States or be stamped out? It was stamped out with the winning of the Union Army, of the Federal Army. And so uh, then out of that comes Reconstruction, but also uh, economically is going to be a very prosperous age for many. Uh, and this time period is, is well, you know, is maybe five, 10 years after the Civil War. So Civil War ends in 1865. And so from the 1870s, basically to the 1910s, about 40 years, there's gonna be tremendous economic growth in the United States. And that's called the Gilded Age. It's gonna make a lot of those that create businesses that sort of harness these new technologies and new energies, gonna make them extremely fabulously wealthy. Uh, but there's still going to be a lot of Americans that are working, that are economically employed, that are going to be struggling to survive. So it's called the Gilded Age. To gild something means to place it in gold on the outside. So on the outside, it looks nice and shiny and golden. And then on the inside, it's kind of rotten. It's just a covering over it. So it looks good, but on the inside, it is really not that strong. And so the historians have used this term. It was originally coined by um, Mark Twain. Uh, to sort of talk about this time period where everything from the outside looks good, but on closer inspection, you can see that everything is not good uh, for all Americans. And so that's what historians have called this time period. And then it evolves into what's called the progressive era, era where all these sort of corruptions in society and in government and economics and business sort of creates a rise of activism that want things changed in our country to make government better, more responsive to the people, uh, to sort of curtail industries and sort of its corruption. And uh, so that leads into what's called the progressive era. So there could be a lot of comparisons between then and to now. So there's a lot of similarities, maybe a lot of parallels uh, between these uh, two periods between then and now. So but again, today I'll just focus on the economics. Again, taking notes on this, but you don't need to take notes on this slide. This is kind of like an overview of where in the middle of the Gilded Age, the United States is by the numbers. So the average wage, so when you're working a job, the average wage is about $13 and you work about 60 hours a week. So in this time in, a, in American history, there's not a 40 hour work week that kind of comes out of this progressive era. Uh, but in 1909, for instance, you're working 60 hours on average. So that's putting in about 10 hours a day and you're working Saturday. Usually you're only granted one day off, which was Sunday to go to church or have at your leisure. Uh, so that's gonna change through the progressive era. But, uh, and about uh, $13 a, a week is about, uh, let's see, I can't remember. You could do the, I don't want to say a number that's wrong. You can do the math and look it up. Uh, but the average life expectancy, so how long males usually lived was 46 years old. How long females usually lived was 48, so two years. Uh, and that's that number goes up every year, basically, until we get to the 2010s. Now the life expectancy uh, for both males and females is dropping a bit. So we've reached sort of the highest point, which is in the 70s for uh, both males and females. 
Uh, and Ellis Island is open at this time and processing immigrants coming mainly from Europe. Uh, and, and we'll get into sort of uh, the different groups that are allowed to immigrate to America and other groups that are not. Specifically, the Chinese are not going to be allowed from 1885 till 1943, I believe, uh, to immigrate to the United States because uh, of racist practices and, and uh, but just a fear that they were going to steal labor. And we'll briefly get into that. Uh, there's 8,000 automobiles only in America, only. Okay, so this is before really the Ford, Ford Motor Company takes off and makes automobiles affordable for uh, many Americans to be able to afford. And uh, for the first time, there's only 10 miles of paved roads. And there's about 76 million Americans. In comparison, we now have 330 million Americans here. Uh, so just about 100 years ago, there's only 76. So tremendous growth and the number of Americans here currently compared to 100 years ago. Some other firsts, you don't need to take notes on this, but animal crackers are invented, your favorite. I know we got a stockpile at my house with my kids. Uh, jukebox, playing songs and music created. Crayola crayons came out. Uh, we had the first flight in 1903, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. Uh, we have the upright vacuum, the Dixie cup, the little paper cup is invented, the electric toaster. The Gillette razor, which I don't like using, but uh, is invented. The license plate to mark those 8,000 automobiles and identify them. As well, the World Series, the Boston Pilgrims were around. They're not the Pilgrims anymore. They're the Red Sox and uh, end up winning uh, one of the first World Series, which is now a 120-year tradition. And uh, so we still have that. It used to be America's like first favorite sport, America's pastime, and it has slowly gets eclipsed by football in the 60s and 70s. But uh, the New Year's celebration uh, happens in New York City for the first time in 1906. So we've had over 100 years, 110 years uh, celebrating New Year's Eve with the ball dropping in New York City. Okay, mm -hmm. so now here's the stuff you should take notes on. I'm going to talk about the nine factors for industrial growth that we call the Gilded Age. So tremendous success economically for America. We really go from uh, still kind of being, you know, we had strong industry, but we weren't leading in the world at all. Europe still led, especially Great Britain. Uh, and as we come out of World War I in this Gilded Age progressive era, we are one of the strongest economies. Again, we are still trailing uh, Great Britain, but it's gonna take World War II before we eclipse them. Uh, in sort of industrial might, uh, but nine factors for So the first sort of reason why we're going to have such tremendous growth, it's also called the second industrial revolution. The first one took place in Great Britain and Europe. The second one happens here uh, is because we're going to have an, uh, some old wealth as in old uh, wealth means wealth that's been around and in families and these families are willing to continue to invest to try to make more money. We are going to have, oh, and it's this capital. So capital is money to invest in new industries and factories. And so who has that capital? It's coming from old wealth. Uh, foreign investors from uh, mainly European countries are going to want to invest in American business and enterprise and the resources that we have in abundance here. Now that we've gone from coast to coast, from east coast to west coast, by this moment and everywhere in between, and we even start to expand to Alaska and Hawaii, and we'll talk about that in the next unit, in our imperialism unit, we are going to have tremendous access to these raw natural resources uh, that are going to help create this industrial revolution. And we're also going to have profits from the gold rush and the gold that comes from California in 1849. That's why they're uh, NFL team is called the 49ers. That was the name given to all the people that came to California to look for gold, the 49ers, hence the football team. And then there's also going to be profits uh, for the Northern industries during the civil war that were just given lots of money to make whatever was needed for the war. And so they continue to generate manufactured goods even after the war. And it helps catapult us. You can think of capital like Shark Tank, if you've seen that TV show. I know I love watching it with all these great product ideas that inventors and entrepreneurs make. Well, they're looking for capital from these rich people that have lots of money. They want to invest in good products and ideas. So they have this capital. And then the contestants go on the show asking for that capital, asking for that money uh, in order to help grow their business and get their product uh, out there into the markets. Okay, number two reason for our growth is gonna be the labor force. 
uh, really our workers. We're going to have skilled and unskilled workers at first. And usually what you had to do was you were a craftsman. You learned some trade. Maybe it was how to make shoes, maybe how to make barrels. And in order to do that job, you would take on apprentices. And we still have those terms in our society now, but those apprentices, you would teach them throughout the course of years, maybe a decade, how to do that job, how to make a barrel, how to make a shoe. And so that when you're gone or, you know, these apprentices are skilled, then they go and open their own sort of shop and business. Uh, and so we have these skilled workers that are, are skilled and takes many years to do it. And then the apprentices, we have that still, like in many of the manual labors, like being an electrician, you have to go be an apprentice or a carpenter, you go be an apprentice. So you're kind of taken under the wing of people that are master craftsmen and know what to do. And you learn from them. And then we also are going to see the emergence of unskilled labor where a lot of companies are producing stuff. They don't need you to know exactly how to do everything. They just need you to do one job and do that one job well, whether it's like to put a lug nut on a tire on a car or, you know, to put a piece of metal on, around the barrel, you know. So we start to see this assembly line work and these factory workers really, they just can show up and do their job and then leave. You don't have to train them. Um, and so we start to see the emergence of these two different kind of labor classes. And so where are this factory labor coming from? Well, it come from farmers and many in America, you know, as America expands westward or going westward, uh, but there's gonna be a tremendous draw to go to cities, be working in cities in these factories, because it's gonna be seen as the standard of living might be a bit higher than being a farmer and being a sort of, you have to plant what, what you're gonna plant and you have to eat that and then you have to sell it to make, to pay off your debts and to make your living. And so it's a, it's a tough, hard scrabble life. Uh, working in factories is the same, but uh, there's gonna be this tremendous draw to make money instead of growing crops for yourself that you have to eat. So, and then immigration. Uh, so you see by the year 1900, before I talk about immigration, 50% uh, of America is farmers at that point. Now there's only about six to 7% of uh, Americans are farmers. So a tremendous drop. Uh, and a, a tremendous a lot of people that have moved to the cities and suburbs uh, and huge metropolitan areas now. Uh, so there's not many people uh, in the interior of America really farming anymore uh, like it used to be 100 years ago. And so immigration is going to be another source of, of all these laborers, people coming from uh, Northern European countries, Western European countries, even Southern countries, Italy and, and Eastern European countries like Greece that are just willing to come in and work these uh, factory jobs. They don't have to speak English. You know, all they got to do is turn a lug nut on the wheel like this guy down here and, and we're calling it good. That's all you had to do and we're paying you for that. So it's going to be a tremendous draw to, for people to come to America when life in Europe is getting especially hard and maybe there's not as much tolerance. Um, and so this can be a huge draw for people to come to America when we have open borders at that time. And we're going to close those borders in the 1920s, by the way. So we'll talk more about that when we get there. Here's new inventions. You should try to take notes on this and be able to remember a couple of these for our assessment, but the steam engine is produced. So now all we gotta do is boil some water. It creates steam energy that we can harness to move a wheel, which is attached you know, to maybe a train or something. It's gonna generate this energy, this movement. Uh, the telegraph, we're sending messages, and that was made by Samuel Morse, and he developed the alphabet that went with it called Morse code, uh, in which it's a bunch of dots and dashes to send a message. Uh, new farm machinery improvements, like John Deere is going to invent the first really iron plow that you still are pulling behind horses and stuff, but it's going to till the earth more efficiently than it ever has before. And then we have things like the reaper, which come now behind horses and a horse uh, you're carrying now this big sort of reaper that's cutting uh, wide swaths you don't have to go out by hand and do it you can just cut a lot of your crops uh, with this reaper that is made and Cyrus McCormick is going to be responsible for making that uh, and then the telephone created here's Alexander Graham Bell who invents the telephone who does he call this first phone call his mom yeah so he had that type of relationship with his mother which is great but uh, he was just like, I'm here in this room. Can you hear me? And it's a paraphrase of what he said. But, uh, you know, his mom was excited to hear him when they weren't in the same room. Uh, and so he is credited with making the telephone. And so he's turned in the electrical signals 
from a voice into electrical current which runs along wires to another receiver that in that speaker is hearing the electrical electrical currents and that sounds like someone's voice so really even today when you're talking on the phone you're talking and that speaker is picking it up the receiver's hearing you and converting it to electrical signal that's then going to you know a cell tower or a satellite and bounce into where you want to go and that person that's hearing you on the other end is hearing your electrical voice which sounds like you but it's an electrical impulse which is kind of interesting to think about uh, bessemer process is the process used to create steel which revolutionizes sort of the industry and the ability to build things, whether it's ships or, or uh, engines, as in uh, train engines or buildings, for instance, is going to revolutionize and help catapult this industrial revolution. Um, and so we need the Bessemer process, which heats up the iron and the other alloys that are used to make steel to a tremendously hot degree, which makes the steel the light bulb invented by Thomas Edison, and we're kind of briefly talking about how this uh, got controversial. So Thomas Edison had all the machinery to make electricity and then tested the light bulb. Other people throughout the country and the world were working on it, but he created the electrical grid to create the electric current to make the light bulb actually work on a reliable. So even though it necessarily wasn't him and one guy, he had a team of people working for him in Menlo Park in his laboratories. He's credited with inventing the light bulb because he made the grid and the light bulb and the filament that went with it. Louis Latimer, if you remember uh, Joe Biden talking about as creating the light bulb, he made a better filament that went across. So he improved upon Thomas Edison's design to make a more reliable light bulb that lasted longer. Uh, but that is going to light things and make the workplace and factories more efficient, make our homes more efficient. Now that have electricity that you can use light bulbs in cities uh, to be able to continue to work and to see at night. Uh, tremendous revolution there. If you think about living just from sun up to sundown and then going to sleep, now you can live from sun up still, but even be up before that using the lights and then after the sun goes down, still using lights. Uh, and then electrical generation. So making electricity is going to electrify life, literally, and, uh, and improve upon standard of living. So, okay. Also, we're going to see improved transportation. This is going to catapult sort of this industrial revolution in America. Canals originally are going to be built in the uh, mid 1800s, especially New York, uh, becomes renowned for what's called the Erie Canal System, which connects New York City down here in the Hudson River, all the way to Albany in the interior of New York, and then it goes all the way west to the Great Lakes. So now you don't have to go through the St. Lawrence River, which goes all the way up here and then kicks you out way high up in the North Atlantic. Now you can just go through the Erie Canal and collect all the stuff in the interior of New York State and farms and dairy and and uh, other sort of things that are generated like steel in these factories. And then you can just ship them by barge down this Erie Canal. So it really revolutionizes transportation. Then steamships, you don't have to rely on the wind and sails. Now you're putting these big steam boilers, you're just heating up water and it's making the paddle board that I'm sure you've seen to catapult these boats, kind of like this one down in the corner. And then lastly, how do you, you know, you don't have waterways, you don't have canals that you can build all over the place. Well. Let's do sort of a, a land canal, and that is the railroad, where you have two steel tracks, and you have this steel uh, steam locomotive, and uh, now you can transport stuff on these rails. It's going to tr revolutionize transportation and how we get things to and fro, how we get people to and fro, and it's going to help populate the interior of the United States and really drive people from the East Coast into the interior and also to the West Coast as well. And this Transcontinental Railroad was the first one built in 1869 that connected the West Coast and the East Coast. And both these, uh, you see these trains meet in Utah. It's the first time we had a team from the East building, basically from Ohio and Missouri. And then they had a team from San Francisco building from the West, basically getting through uh, California and the Sierra Nevada mountains, got through Nevada and then to Utah and they meet. It really wasn't the middle, but you know, it took a lot longer to get through the mountains than it did to go through the plains of nothing. Uh, and so they met in Promontory, Utah. You could still go there and they have, my mom's been there and has talked about it. They drive this train, this old steam train, which is a recreation of this train right here. I can't remember its name. And so, but this is where they met from the East met west in, in this point it's kind of a cool spot they drove in a golden stake that's still there and you can see it uh, still uh, another thing that's driving our 
industry is consumer demand. So our markets uh, that exist in cities in the United States and in Europe, we're going to have all this uh, manufactured stuff, things that are being produced in these factories that consumers want, like Coca-Cola. You want some Coca-Cola? The original recipe did have cocaine in it, which made it so addicting and smooth. And this is how you drink your Coke too, right? You stick your pinky up and drink it. Uh, and you dress up in your Sunday best in order to enjoy it. Not really, but that would, is a good example of stuff being made in this time. New products are being developed that the public wants, and we call that consumer demand. And so consumers that are working these factories making money or managing people making money or they have a business where they're making money get to spend that money now on these other things like toasters and vacuums and electricity, light bulbs, uh, or Coca-Cola, because these manufactured goods are making life easier. And also we're gonna see more and more people move into the cities. We call this urbanization, where they're moving from rural areas to urban areas, urbanization. So the buildup of these cities, cities are gonna to continue to grow more people because this is the place where the factories are and where the jobs are. And so a lot of people are leaving their farming life. And when they leave their farming life, they're not growing and making their own clothes, things like that. So they have to purchase all those things. And so that's really gonna continue to drive consumer demand too. Here's a very popular item to have in the early 1900s was a sewing machine. So yeah, you could go to the store, maybe buy stuff, but a lot of people made their own clothes uh, and used the sewing machine because it's going to speed up that process and make it a lot better and easier. Another reason that we're going to be successful economically is our access to raw materials here in this country. Uh, from coast to coast, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of resources, whether it's water or coal that we are mining out, uh, even in eastern Washington, Roslyn, and the Cascade Mountains are going to be rich with coal. You can still go see those old coal mines uh, like Suncadia, Cle Elm, that area. Roslyn has a lot of old coal mines. Uh, we're going to have rich timber resources in our, in our mountain areas like we enjoy in this state. Lots of minerals, so things that we are harnessing uh, out of uh, the earth and oil coming from the earth too. Discovered in California, discovered in Texas, we're going to see that this can generate electricity, uh, generate energy for us, and it's become very useful, uh, especially with the help of making the automobile so successful, and then iron ore, which we need to convert to steel uh, and help uh, make a lot of our goods, okay? And so another thing that's going to propel our success is just our American attitudes, which are really unique in the world. Uh, even currently, but uh, in this time, even more unique, just because uh, like American citizens weren't dependent on the government. They weren't dependent on companies per se. They weren't dependent uh, on their family. I mean, they were to a certain degree, but we had this belief kind of coming from our revolution, coming through the expansion of American values, like, hey, I'm, it's me. And so I'm a rugged individualist in which, you know, whatever happens to me is my fault uh, or whatever good happens to me is my fault as well. So I'm sort of made on exactly what I can do. The uniqueness of America is this opportunity. It's a lane of opportunity to do whatever you really want to. And if you success, that's if you succeed, that's because of you. If you fail, that's on you too. And so that gets to this idea where Hey, it's on you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and to be who you want to be. Okay, but this attitude also embraces progress in technology, which in Europe wasn't necessarily, it was great, but, you know, America is going to expand on the, those principles and the scientific method and, and research and develop uh, products that the world had never seen before. And so class does not matter. You know, you could have a guy that grew up on the slums of New York City that goes on and you know, invents a great product or, you know, becomes a politician or becomes rich and wealthy, like it doesn't matter. So this is feeds into this idea of America being a land of opportunity and you can be whoever you want to be and dream to be. And then also there's this uh, idea at the time, which uh, historians frown upon now, we look back, we're like, oh, that's awful. But uh, based on uh, Darwin's biological theory of survival of the species, you know, the most fittest survive, uh, sort of a sociologist at the time started applying it to society too and say it's not just a biological thing where animals in the animal kingdom are doing it it's also a sociological thing where humans 
are also doing the same thing and applying the same strategy. So the wealthy people are the winners. They're the strongest, they're the smartest, and so they should be rewarded with wealth. And the poor people, well, they're the losers. They're losers because they didn't have the, the right sort of uh, determination or they're lazy. Okay, and so people are sh shifting themselves out based on this idea of social Darwinism. We're gonna run into a lot of problems with it as we come out of the reconstruction uh, time period is going to start being tied to race where they're going to say certain races are elevated above other races because they can't be smart enough or there's they're going to uh, just say that they don't have the same opportunities because they uh, because of their race and uh, it's going to sort of reach its pinnacle in Nazi Germany which is going to use race this idea of survival of the fittest we're making a strong uh, Aryan race that's going to dominate the rest of the world which we know is not true and so uh, we're going to come to grips with this in the world, not just in America, but in the world uh, in World War II. And, and uh, it sort of peters out after that and launches us into the civil rights movement too, which we'll get there in the second semester. Okay, government policies are also going to improve our economic lot here in America. We're going to have what's called laissez-faire capitalism. It's a French word for hands off. So it's basically that government regulation, uh, sort of taxing business is going to be very loose. Okay, and the government's gonna have their hands off to let businesses kind of do and have their way to generate wealth, generate jobs uh, is the main reason that government's just gonna be like, okay, you know, we want our tax money here and there, okay, but we're really gonna do what we can to stimulate business because it generates jobs and is creating tremendous wealth and a higher standard of living in America. So government's gonna keep its hands off, uh, but go government also is gonna encourage industrialization by having high tariffs. So we're going to be taxing stuff coming into America from other countries. Okay, we're also going to give sort of land grants, free land to railroads, like this picture here. Basically, if railroad companies built a railroad, they would get 20 miles on either side in this checkerboard. These are like the red boxes are one square mile of land. So railroad companies would be granted all this land and then what would the other sort of white squares be used for well people could come and settle in these squares they and just depending on what region of america they'd be given sort of free land as long as they went and settled it and improved upon it this is part of the homestead act of 1863 passed by Abraham lincoln like hey go out and settle you know but the railroad companies would get the red areas so any timber any you know minerals there any water you know any sort of uh animals that were there that was all became uh, railroad property so you could see how these railroads had tremendous power and influence and also wealth in this time because they're building a railroad which is extremely costly and time consuming but in exchange they're getting tremendous value in the land and the resources of america at the time so it's why we're going to see most of our wealthiest americans in this time period are railroad owners uh, or railroad uh, company men Okay, and so also there's going to be policies against labor unions, which is workers collecting together and saying, hey, we're not working unless you give us a pay wage increase, or we're not working. So uh, federal troops are actually going to go in and break up strikes like that and harm people, kill people, just because they are, you know, demanding uh, better workplace conditions or higher wages from their employer. And then there's also the court is going to step in and make strikes illegal in many states and uh, in wartime gonna make them legal too, so. And then lastly, this will be our last slide. The leaders of business are gonna create this tremendous wealth and this revolution of industry and business in America. Uh, we're gonna have tremendously smart people and smart minds. Now they're highly criticized to this day. Um, and we'll talk about that going forward, but these entrepreneurs, to be an entrepreneur basically means to look for opportunities to generate wealth and to generate jobs. And some of our most famous entrepreneurs are going to be Andrew Carnegie, who's going to take sort of the steel industry and revolutionize it. He's going to sort of uh, hone the process, the best in process of creating steel, and he's going to own basically mines that mine out the iron ore and then he's going to own the trains that transport it to the his factories that then turn that iron add alloys to it and make steel and then he's going to sell the steel from there so he's going to have what we call a monopoly uh, where he is going to own all those portions of that process and make steel and he's going to basically just wipe out the rest of his competition because he can do it more efficiently because he owns all the processes in that we call that 
uh, a vertical monopoly. And then there's another man who's pictured, sorry, this is Carnegie here. He's been highly criticized to this day because on the one hand, he'll tell his workers, hey, I'm paying you nothing. I'm paying you no money, even though you're asking for more. On the other hand, I'm taking all this millions of dollars that I'm making uh, through my workers and I'm gonna create libraries and create universities and encourage uh, the arts, for instance, like that. So it's, a lot of people uh, think he's pretty savage because he kind of has this dual sort of relationship with his workers and then uh, with what he gives. So these people are gonna give tremendous amounts of money. So they're also what we call philanthropists, but did they amass it in kind of corrupt ways? Well, it just depends on which person you're looking at. Not all of them were, were like that, but Carnegie was heavily criticized. And this guy, his name is John Rockefeller, also heavily criticized. And so he became uh, basically the oil baron is what we call him, where he had a monopoly in basically all the refineries in America. So people would get oil, whether it was like the hillbillies in Texas discovered oil, uh, or you discovered oil in California in the interior of the United States. Well, you have this crude oil and then it had to be refined. So what Rockefeller did is he owned all the refineries that refined that oil in the United, in the United States called Standard Oil and turned it into gasoline and to oil to lube your engines and things like that. So if you wanted to buy oil and gas, pretty much you had to buy from Standard Oil and gas. And so he got tremendously wealthy. Uh, because he was the one guy. So both these individuals had monopolies in their industries and they have been the richest Americans up until the last 10 years since Jeff Bezos has taken off with Amazon. And uh, he has now been the wealthiest American in, in, in American history. But it used to be Carnegie and Rockefeller up until 10 years ago, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And so, but our job and what we're gonna talk about next time I see you, is you're gonna write a paper, you're gonna research one of these entrepreneurs of this time period, and you're gonna write a pa research paper on them. And you have to determine, hey, did this person generate their wealth through good means? As in, they made their money in a good way, they didn't cheat their workers, and then maybe they gave a lot of their money away, that's pretty good. Or are they what's called a robber baron, who is an American capitalist, uh, who became wealthy through exploitation. So exploited workers, exploited government influence and government giving them lots of land for, to make railroads, for instance, uh, exploited natural resources. So you're gonna have to decide that on your own. Is my person, are they you know, generally a good entrepreneur and capitalist or were they an evil capitalist or entrepreneur, which history calls them a robber baron. So you're gonna have to decide based on which person you choose and the research that you find is your person not a robber baron or are they a robber baron and we'll get into more details of that next time we're in class but that's going to be it for me today i'm signing off um and i appreciate you taking notes and again you guys know that you'll see uh this info on our test so prepare yourself thanks for taking the notes